Bill Heard from Hackaday. Today I'm going to be getting uh, control of my analog from some digital processing. And uh, let me show you what I mean. If you saw the Universal Active Filter uh, video that we did just a little while ago, um, you'll see that I picked a component that, that allowed me to build a filter where all I had to do was adjust a couple of resistors. And that made it easy for a human to turn a knob and sweep band pass, low pass, up and down. Uh, as opposed to varying multiple components all at once. That set the stage for then stepping in with a microcontroller or a processor, but these days uh, I know a lot of people are using the microcontrollers out there, the AVRs, the PICs. Um, these things are very um, I.O. heavy. They're, they're made to take in input and, and put out output, and the, most of the projects I see for that, versus, uh, you know, as a systems designer in the old days, uh, you know, I was designing a, a core that did 80% thinking and only 20% inputting and outing, but a lot of baggage went with that where, where versus the little stuff we can do today, you know, based on the AVR, for example. So I wanted to take that universal active filter, and if we look here, I'm going to pop up an image, and we see that I have this dual-ganged pot, um, and I want to replace that with two digitally controlled potentiometers. Pot means potentiometer, not the other stuff. So um, that kind of, you know, set the stage for this next step. So here I want to uh, point you at, I'm going to show you this, the, the data sheet um, for a pot I picked just by going through the parameters real quick, probably used DigiKey and whittled it down and, and then bought them and brought them in. And so let's take a look at that digital pot spec. Here's the uh, data sheet for the uh, a microchip um, single digital uh, potentiometer with an SPI interface. We're going to talk about SPI in a second. But if you look here, essentially what you'll see are uh, it's using the word wiper. It's got you know pictures of resistors in here and control logic and some digital uh, shift registering going on. So quite simply, it's a way to shift in logic and create different resistance values. Now, I don't work for microchip. I just picked this one out of the blue. Um, there are plenty of them out there, and uh, um, picking one depends on your criteria at hand, the voltage, the amount of resistance, and the interface. So in this case, it's SPI, and uh, let's talk about SPI and, and I2C, I2C, I um, the other one that's really out there for doing this kind of thing. These are, here are two of the prevalent um, serial control protocols. And, and by that we mean we take just a couple of uh, uh, data lines, I.O. lines, and we can talk to lots of slaves and, or lots of devices, and we can say a lot to them. And that's why this came about was, uh, you know, the chips were getting big in the early 2000s when Philips developed I2C. Um, and you didn't want to run your address bus and your, and your data bu uh, bus over there or, or, or do all kinds of distilling down to create a chip select just to talk to the registers in one of these devices. So they came up with this common bus called I2C. And it's, it's, it's a protocol that's been very well specified to the point where the addresses that are defined for these, you actually have to go and get those addresses from Philips if you want to be uh, certified, NXP, whatever they're called today. And then what you can do is you can set jumpers too. So let's say you had two of the same one. Well, you don't want them on the same address. Um, you can set jumpers to, to like, say, uh, 2001, 2002. Um, and so that's the way this works is this guy says, I'm addressing somebody, and here's some data, and here's some more data. And by the way, I'm the master. And later a slave can even wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to fight you for the bus. I win. I'm now the master. Here's some data. Here's some data. Um, SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface. By the way, this means uh, intelligent uh, intercommunication, something like that. I, I, I forget. Uh, we just call it I2C. SPI, uh, Serial Peripheral Interface. Um, the It's more of an attitude than it is a protocol, I'll, I'll tell you. And I say that because uh, I've seen some different specs for how the select lines can work and things. But essentially, we have a clock that goes to everybody. There's a data out that goes to everybody and a data in that goes to everybody. And it's the chip selects that determine which of these guys to be talking to. So it can only be one master, one slave, and or one master and multiple slaves, depending on how many of these chip selects you have. So no setting of addresses, but setting of these. So that means there's some logic going on that says maybe you are end up decoding some things, or maybe you first write to a register, picture, chip select, and then do it. Um, but this is uh 
it, if you're working with I2C and it's already been debugged, it's wonderful. I've had to debug it down at a very low level and it, it can be a real pain. Uh, SPI, um, easy to use. And guess what? Our digital potentiometer that I picked out uses SPI. And I, I did want to show you real quick before we moved on, um, kind of the guts of, of a digital potentiometer. And almost always when we talk about controlling the resistance of a component, it's almost always an FET, field effect transistor. Um, a transistor gets involved. It's a current driven device. It's a combination of how much phase current, how much. An FET is give me a certain amount and I will change my conductance, my MO, which is ohm. And so it becomes a resistive device. And in fact, inside integrated circuits where we use FETs, um, in the early NMOS days, we had NAND gates and OR gates, exclusive NOR, but who's counting? Um, inverters and then a pass device and that's where you took the device put it right in line and if you look here um, I'm showing some pass devices uh, in series with different resistors and that's what happens is the SPI logic picks out which resistance you want so if I write a 212 using the SPI interface it's going to select the and turn on the FETs in series with the 212 resistance that's already on the on the chip and uh, that, that becomes our digital potentiometer value. So there's two, two ways to have designed, you know, something with three components where we've got the thing you want to control, the digital potentiometer in the middle, and the controlling processor microcontroller on the end. Now, I started from the side where I said, hey, here's the circuit, here's a pot that's compatible, what, does, what kind of controller do I need? You could have done it the other way. You might have said, hey, I'm really checked out the controller, I want to use it and work your way back towards the circuitry. Either one's valid. So in my case then, it's like, okay, I'm now on SPI. What do I need to do? Well, I looked at the bus pirate. Um, great for bit banging or, or byte banging, I should say. Uh, bring up a terminal, you get running, start poking into some registers if you just need to set up a chip. In my case, I wanted something interactive. I wanted the resistance to keep changing while I'm filming here. So, um, you know, I thought about driving this from, you know, a raw mode, a language, just took a little more uh, effort than I had time for. I thought, well, I could strap it to a, a, a Unix system, and uh, it's more closely coupled. You get the driver, you know, you dev it into place, and, and open it up as if it was a file, because in Unix, everything's just a file. And uh, so I said, well, I could drive it from a Raspberry Pi. But kind of redundant. Raspberry Pi's got a SP, SPI built in it, I squared C. And uh, everybody's got one. So if everybody's got one, I thought, well, I could try an ARIA to G25, just to be different. I could put it with this, just to be redundant. At the end of the day, none of these things had a skull on them. So I chose the uh, Hackaday Pro Trinket. And uh, I'd show you one here. Uh, here, let's, let's put an image of one in here for you. Can't show you mine. It's on the bench, completely covered in wires. Um, that's why we're talking on this camera today. Uh, and when we're done here, we will go look at the big pile of wires. So picking through the data sheet, we find that the first eight bits uh, kind of figure out the addressing, and the second eight bits uh, configure the data, the, the value you want the resistor to be. Now, there's a lot of things this potentiometer does. It's got non-volatile RAM. You can store the wiper setting, the wiper, the potentiometer. Uh, we don't care about any of that. We're actually going to be writing to location zero. will affect the wiper immediately. So I know that I'll be writing a zero, and then from zero to 256 over here, uh, just to make the register values, the resistor value go up and down in 250, you know, of the 256 steps. So uh, that's the value we're going to be writing. Let's jump into a way to get that over to the digital potentiometer. Okay, here's a... Um, one of the Arduino development environments uh, version, uh, you can't see it, it's version 1.05. Uh, this isn't the uh, type I use typically. I, I tend to go with something that's got handles more of the picks and things. Uh, but this one already has everything I need built in to manage the Trinket Pro. So grab this off Adafruit, installed it, and it does indeed talk to the Trinket Pro right out of the, out of the gate. So. I went to look for examples, and if we go there, we find that there are SPI examples, and lo and behold, there's a digital POC control example. This is what I meant when I said, well, you could have done it the other way, because had I started with the Trinket Pro, I would have found the digital POT example, and I might have used the part it's already compiled to use, or pre-configured to use, I should say. 
Um, but it was no big deal. Uh, I, I go into the code, it's, it's C, and I said, hey, for the first channel, um, you, you know, which is in here, this shows an incoming channel. I set it to be the channels, you know, the first byte's always zeros. And then the second part is the uh, value changing up and down to, to 255 and compiled it, uploaded it. It does not use, um, you, you need the, uh, uh, the bootloader thing, not, not the, uh, not the USB thing on this one. And, uh, and it worked basically right out of the gate. So finally, let's go over to the bench and see this sucker working. Here we are back at the bench and it's, uh, it's quite a bit messier than normal. Uh, and in fact, if I, this was a real R and D project, I would stop and, uh, reconsider how I've done things. Uh, but this is a video and I'm under a time constraint, so we're going to keep going. Uh, the, and I'll give you an overhead shot here in a second. I actually used a breadboard this time. Uh, I normally don't because of the issue of, as you're trying to move things around, something else will change. Um, I did shoot a PC board for this video that showed the digital pots hooked right up. And uh, I just couldn't thread the needle as far as the, the, the split supplies for the analog, the supply for the, for the trinket, the supply for the uh, digital pots themselves. And actually, even this one here where I've got going, if I hook up one last cable from the trigger from a piece of equipment behind me over to one of the scopes, everything stops working. Um, I'm not surprised. There's, there's probably all kinds of ground sneak paths, and yet it's still working. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that for demonstration purposes. So let me give you an overhead shot of what we got going, and then I'll break it down for you. So here's what we got going today. We have the Trinket Pro. Um, hopefully I can unplug it, show you the skull on the bottom uh, before we're done here today. It's controlling via SPI these three wires over to the two digital pots that are on the solderless breadboard. And all they do is they bring over two wires and a ground, but two wires, one for each resistor, and that replaces the resistor function we had in the um, universal active filter earlier. So let me show, start out by showing you the SPI that we have going here, the three-wire interface, and we'll follow it through the circuit. Now I have a new oscilloscope in the in the uh, shop here, uh, a Tektronix MDO thirty one hundred four, courtesy of my good friends at Tektronix, and this is the web interface on it. So it allows uh, me to really zoom in and, and show you what's going on here. Uh, I've labeled the three lines for the SPI: the clock, the data, the select, the, the chip select, and uh, you can see that the first event, the event I'm actually triggering on, is the select going, and then we have two sets of eight clocks. Remember I said that the first word needed to be all zeros, so easy to eyeball. Here you can then see it pushing down the, the value as it's counting up in binary, um, or counting down. I, I, I didn't look to see which one it's actually doing. Um, now this scope does include an SPI uh, decoder if I was doing actual data commands and I'd want to see a 5A followed by a B0. But this is easy for us to see. We've got a zero and then walking numbers. So it's easy for us to see the output over on the bench. And if, if you don't remember or, or you didn't see the, uh, the video on universal active filters, here again is, is the, the analog that we are controlling where there are two external resistors that we've now replaced with the digital pots. And what they do is they affect where this high pass filter, where this low pass filter, and where this band pass filter are. So as I were to turn these up and down, you would see the band pass filter moving up and down. Now I'm changing these under SPI control from my Hackaday Pro Trinket. And let's take a look at what that waveform looks like. And here we see the, the output of our work on the top. In, in, in the top, you'll see several cycles of the sweep frequency generator labeled sweep in is cycling from a low to a high frequency. And then the blue line on the bottom, low pass, is the output of the low pass filter as it is swept up and down also. So it's letting a variable number, a variable amount of the signal through based on the commands being sent from I squared C. If you carry the thinking behind this further out, um, you know, this demonstrates that you could do something like have a, the equivalent of an analog synth synthesizer, only instead of using control voltages that you got to get extremely linear and tracking each other and tracking for temperature, you could use something simple like an SPI or an I squared C bus 
and send these commands that sweep filters and frequencies and oscillators and everything and have them all be you know perfectly in line because at the heart of it it's it's a command that says go to a thousand hertz just to kind of prove that um the mechanism here was really a, a, a variable resistor a very analog thing again at the heart is probably an fet or several uh, you can see my old simpson uh, 260 that i've had since i was 17 and it's about as beat up as I am. Uh, but it's displaying. I, what I've done is I've unplugged two wires that ran to the filter. Can't quite see them. And I've just run them to the resistance on this. And, uh, and here's one of those times when a linear meter kind of tells you more what's going on. If you put a DMM on there, you just see a bunch of jumpy numbers. So, again, a uh, demonstration of our... Mastery over analog as, as done with an SPI bus. Hopefully this made sense uh, as I walk through the different steps. Um, I'm sure if you've done this, you've got your own flavors, your own versions. You'd say, why did he do that? No reason, just playing around, right? Uh, but no, we, we, we you know, took it from one end to another. And uh, you know, like I said, these days, the, the microcontroller environment is one that's very IO heavy. And so here's how to, you know, cobble up a couple pieces and in this case we made a variable resistor that could control a variable filter or as you saw in the simpson even uh, uh you know act as tr as a true variable resistor i'm going to stop there uh we covered a lot of things uh, actually went through the uh, design process if you think about it from beginning to end we're, we're processor on one side something in the middle and our output on the other end uh, and the microcontroller uh, uh, varieties these days are, are very I.O. intensive, analog intensive. You don't need to build your own of many things. Uh, but a variable resistor isn't a normal thing, so that's why we tackled it. And it goes along well with uh, the, what we are just coming off of from the universal active filter. Uh, I was going today actually build some white noise sources, show you sweeping, and, you know, no, we've, we've done enough. I, it's, uh, maybe we'll do that in a later one and, and talk about those kind of things. So Bill Hurd from Hackaday, I uh, hope again this made sense and I uh, hope it gave you an idea or something of something you could do or know that you can do more than just what the chip already does. So again, Bill Hurd from Hackaday and uh, I'll catch you next time.